Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are the judges of the evidence to be laid before you. Be just and fear not, for the true administration of justice is the foundation of good government. <laughs> Famous jury trials, dramatizations of cases taken from actual court history. The names of persons and places have been altered to protect the identity of those concerned. The State versus Thomas Crosby. <laughs> are you ready for the State, Mr. District Attorney? We are. You ready for the defense, Counselor? We are. It was in the summer resort town of Wheeler's Landing that Thomas Crosby went on trial for his life. And the courtroom of the little town was crowded with curious summer vacationers who had left their holiday pleasures to witness the dramatic murder trial. Most of those present knew the middle-aged wealthy defendant, Tom Crosby, and knew the story of how the body of his beautiful young wife had been found at nearby Wheeler Lake beside her overturned boat. The residents of Wheeler's Landing had been shocked by that tragedy, and even more horrified when Thomas Crosby was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. Now in the courtroom... The trial that had been awaited with excited anticipation was beginning. We commence tonight's famous jury trial, The State versus Thomas Crosby. The defendant, Thomas Crosby, looking older than his 41 years, his handsome, sensitive face lined with the anxiety and strain of the past weeks, sat listening intently to the district attorney as he reached the conclusion of his opening address to the jury and called his first witness, James Abbott, brother of the murdered woman. James Abbott, you are the brother of the deceased, Lenore Crosby? Yes, I am. You uh, were close to each other. She confided in you? Yes, we were very close to each other. Shortly before her death, did she express fears of violence at the hands of her husband, the defendant? Yes. Uh, she told me he'd threatened her life. She wanted me to talk to him. She she seemed badly frightened. She said Tom was wild about her friendship with Fred Blake, that it was harmless, and she wanted me to explain that. And did you speak to Tom Crosby? Yes. He told me to mind my own business, as I might have expected. And now, on the night of July the 18th, did you see the defendant and your sister, Lenore? Yes. I was giving a small dance at the yacht club. Both Tom and Lenore were there. And uh, did you notice when they left? Yes, about 10 o'clock. Lenore told me she wasn't feeling well and was going outside for a while, and she left. Tom Crosby was watching her and started to follow. And what did you do? I tried to stop him. I told him Lenore had a headache and wanted to be left by herself for a little while. But he just laughed at me. An ugly, snarling laugh and pushed me out of his way and followed Lenore. And that was the last time you saw your sister alive? Yes, it was. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Cross-examine. Mr. Abbott. You stated that the defendant was jealous of his wife. Didn't she give him great cause for jealousy? I don't know what you mean by that. Wasn't she constantly gossiped about? Wasn't her name linked with one man after another? Yes, there was gossip. But it was idle, vicious gossip. Lenore was one of those women who can't help attracting men. She was young and married to a man much older than she was who bullied her and spied on her. Is it any wonder she was flattered and pleased... What other men showed that they thought she was attractive? Your Honor, I ask that all of that be stricken as not responsive. Strike out everything except the first word, yes. Now, the last man your sister's name was linked with was Frederick Blake, was it not? Yes. But if you think... Please. Was Blake at the dance you gave on July 18th? No. I'd invited him, but he said he wasn't feeling well and couldn't come. Oh, he wasn't feeling well. And then your sister said she wasn't feeling well. Mr. Abbott, didn't your sister leave the dance to keep a rendezvous with Frederick Blake? Objection. Sustained. That's a foul, vicious lie. What right have you got to make an accusation like that? Order, please. That's all, Mr. Abbott. But, Your Honor, nobody can say that sort of thing and get away with it. My sister was one of the finest, truest, most lovable people who ever lived. And that fiend murdered her. Order, order. Step down, Mr. Abbott. I apologize, Your Honor. I'm not myself. I apologize. Call Henry Farley. Henry Farley... Take the stand. 
And if I led you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, enough about the truth to help you, God. I do. Harry Farley, you're in charge of the boats of the Wheeler Yacht Club? Yes, sir, Mr. Jones. You ought to know that. Now, on the night of July the 18th, did you see the defendant there with his wife? Yes, sir. Uh, it was a little after 10 that night when I heard someone go out on the dock where all the boats were tied up. So I got up and looked out of the window to see what's going on. Might have been someone trying to steal the boat. And could you see who it was? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, there's, there's a landing light there, and I see it's Mrs. Crosby, and she unties the Crosby's boat and starts the outboard motor and sails off out onto the lake. And then what happened? Uh, well, about, uh, about ten minutes later, I hear someone else on the dock, and I look, and it's Mr. Crosby. And what did he do? Oh, he gets in a launch what don't belong to him and starts off after Mrs. Crosby. I shout at him because I don't know whether he's got any right to take that launch, but uh, he don't pay no attention and and uh, he's gone before I can stop him. Do you know if that launch was fast enough to catch up to the outboard, even with the head start Mrs. Crosby had? Oh, sure. The launch will go twice as fast as the outboard. I see. Now, uh... Did you see Mr. Crosby again that night? Uh, yeah, but it, it was later. Now, I went back to bed, so I don't exactly know how much later. Um, oh, an hour, maybe. Anyways, I hear a boat come in, and it's Mr. Crosby in the lawn. Alone? Sure, alone. And did you hear Mrs. Crosby come back? No, sir, she never came back. Take the witness. No questions. Call Dr. Albert Lanahan. Dr. Albert Lanahan? Dr. Albert Lanahan. Dr. Albert Lanahan. Doctor, did you examine the body of Lenore Crosby? Uh, yes, sir. They'd found her body out on the lake and her boat capsized, so everyone figured it was a case of drowning, but uh, there wasn't any water in her lungs. She was dead before she was ever in the water. And could you determine the cause of her death? Easy as pie. She'd been strangled, no doubt about it. And, Doctor... Did you examine the defendant that same day? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he was scratched all over the hands and face. Thank you, Doctor. You're with us. Doctor, did you examine Mrs. Crosby's fingernails to see if there were any traces of skin or flesh under them? Uh, yes, I did, but I, uh, I didn't find anything. But aren't such traces usually found when someone has violently scratched another person? Yes, but not always. Scratches such as you examined on Mr. Crosby could have been caused by a rough fall, couldn't they? Yes, I reckon they could. That is all. Paul Darley Small is next witness for the state. Darley Small! Darley Small! Darley Small! Miss Small, you were a maid in the Crosby's household? Yes, sir, I was. Were you up and on duty at uh, around 11 o'clock on the night of July 18th? Yes, sir. I was waiting up for Mrs. Crosby to help her undress. She always made me wake up, even when she wasn't going to get in till three or four in the morning. And expected me to go on with my duties the next day, same as if I hadn't been up half of the night waiting to undress her. Not that half the time she didn't need someone to undress her, because she did. She could Yes, in yes, and... yes, Miss Small. Well, right now, we're concerned with the night of July the 18th. Did Mrs. Crosby come in that night? Sure, and how could she? And her lying dead out on the lake. Did you wait up for her? No, sir. Not after 11. You didn't? No, sir. Mr. Crosby said I needn't. He said Mrs. Crosby wouldn't be coming in. What? Yes, sir. It was just about 11 when I heard the front door open. So I peeked over the banister to see who it was. And it was Mr. Crosby. And a rare state he was in, to be sure. His face and hands all scratched up, and him all out of breath and wild looking. Give me quite a turn, and I, I gave a little scream. I couldn't help it. And he looked up and saw me peeking over the banister. Is that you, Dorothy? Yes, sir. Why, whatever is the matter with you, Mr. Crosby? Your face? Here, I'll come right down and help you. Ah, never mind. Nothing. I had a fall coming through the woods. Scratched up a bit. But can't I do anything? No, no, thanks. I'm just going to lock up and go to bed. Oh, sir, don't lock the door. Mrs. Cross is not in yet. I know it. She won't be coming in anymore. Why, whatever do you mean, sir? No, never mind. You can go to bed now. 
You needn't wait up any longer. I'll see to the lights down here. And the defendant locked up the house for the night? Yes, sir. You can imagine what I thought, knowing her as I did. Oh, I must say, I, I never imagined anything like the truth. When I think that I spent the night in the same house with a murderer... Objection I... sustained. Strike out all of that except the answer, yes, sir. Now, Miss Small, try and confine your answers to the question. Yes, sir. That's all. Cross-examine. Miss Small, you knew a good deal about Mrs. Crosby's private life, didn't you? That I did. More than our poor husband ever suspected. More than once I wanted to tell him a thing or two. But of Yes, course, yes, I... yes. You knew that Mrs. Crosby was unfaithful to her husband. Objection, Your Honor. I object to this whole line of questioning. Mrs. Crosby's character is entirely irrelevant to the charge against her husband. Uh, just what is the purpose of your question, Counselor? Uh, your Honor, I am trying to establish that Mrs. Crosby was unfaithful not with one man, but with many men, in order to show that she was not even faithful to her lover at the moment. Specifically, I want to show that not only the defendant, but Frederick Blake had the motive of jealousy to drive him to murder. You mud-swinging you can't say that about me. <laughs> Mr. Robert! Order, order! <laughs> James Abbott, brother of the murdered woman, completely lost control of himself when he heard his sister's character attacked, and he sprang from his feet in the courtroom to try and force the defense attorney to retract the charges, and he had to be forcibly removed. But people wondered, was it possible that Lenore Crosby was murdered by a jealous lover? Or was her husband as guilty as he seemed? We will continue with this trial in just a moment. And now back to the courtroom. The defense lawyer begins his desperate fight to save the life of Tom Crosby. And we will prove to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that there were others who had equal motive and equal opportunity to murder Lenore Crosby. We will convince you that there is more than a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt. Yes. I call as my first witness the defendant himself so that you may hear his story from his own lips. Call Thomas Crosby. Tom Crosby took the stand and was sworn in. He appeared to have aged during the ordeal of the trial. His handsome face was strained, and the graying hair of his temples seemed accentuated as he began his story. It is true that I was jealous of Lenore's friendship with other men. Well, that was partly, I suppose, my punishment for marrying a beautiful young girl, knowing in my heart that it was my money and not me that she wanted and partly it was because she gave me good grounds for my jealousy. Your Honor, I object to all this biased explanation. It isn't evidence. To sustain. Mr. Crosby, did you ever threaten your wife with actual violence? Uh, yes, I did. I was trying to frighten her. I thought if she was really afraid of me, she wouldn't dare... Yes. To... And did you have any proof that she was unfaithful to you? Well, no, no actual proof. But I'd been watching her and this man, Frederick Blake, for weeks. I was convinced that they were meeting secretly. And the night that Lenore was killed, I was sure of it. What made you so certain? Well, that morning I overheard her making an appointment. I wasn't able to hear with whom. And I determined not to let Lenore out of my sight at the dance, to follow her if she left and find out who she was meeting, though I was sure it was Blake. And what happened? Well, we got to the dance about nine. And just before ten, I saw Lenore slip away. I followed her down to the boat landing and saw her get into our boat and start off across the lake. <clears throat> well, I let her get a few minutes start, and then I tried to follow her in a launch. But I couldn't get the thing started. Not for five minutes. And when I finally did, I'd lost her. It was a dark, cloudy night, and I couldn't see anything. I tried to follow the sound of the outboard, but it stopped in a few minutes. And I knew she must have landed somewhere, oh, probably on one of the islands in the lake, but... I couldn't tell which one. And what did you do then? I cruised around for half an hour or so, trying to find her, and then I gave up and came on in. And did you return to the dance? No, no. 
When I got back to the landing, the meaning of the whole thing suddenly burst on me. Somehow, somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd always kidded myself that Lenore really did love me, but there on the landing that night, I suddenly realized that I'd been right all along, that there could be no innocent explanation, that Lenore was at that moment with some man. And what did you do? Well, I don't know, really. I, I stumbled home through the woods. I tripped and fell a couple of times and bumped into trees, but I really didn't feel anything. I was dazed, all lost, and gone inside because I knew Leonore and I were finished. And when you got home, what happened? I locked up the house, locked her out, made up my mind she'd never enter my house again. And you did not see your wife from the time she left the boat landing that night until the time her body was found beside her overturned boat? No, I did not. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Take the witness. Mr. Crosby, you were very jealous of your wife. Yes, I, I expect I was. I I loved her. You threatened her life on more than one occasion? Yeah, but I, I didn't mean it. I was trying to scare her. Never mind the explanations. You threatened her life. Yeah. And when you followed her out on the lake that night, didn't you uh, catch up to her in your lunch? No, I tell you, I lost her. You didn't catch up to her and confront her with your knowledge of the phone message you say you heard that morning? No, I tell you, I didn't see her. You didn't accuse her of having a lover... And you did not then and there put into action the threat you had so often made and uh, strangle her with your bare hands? No, I tell you, I didn't. I'd never have killed her. I loved her. I loved her. Yes, according to your admission, you loved her so much you threatened to kill her. And that night on the lake, while she clawed at your face and hands in her dying agony, you slowly and mercilessly choked her as you said you would, didn't you? No, 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 I tell you, I loved her. Lenore. Lenore. That is all. Call Frederick Blake. Frederick Blake. Frederick Blake. Frederick Blake. Mr. Blake, there was a good deal of gossip linking your name with Mrs. Crosby's, wasn't there? Yes, I'm afraid there was. Uh, people in a place like this have nothing else to do but gossip. But there wasn't any truth in what they hinted at about me and Lenore. No truth in it? None whatsoever. Are you sure, Mr. Blake? Take a look at these letters here. Are these in your handwriting? What? Where did you get them? From the wall safe in Lenore Crosby's bedroom. I ask you again, are those letters in your handwriting? I told her to burn them. They are yours. Yes, but it doesn't prove anything. I admit I loved her, but, but I didn't kill her. You haven't anything on me. Do you deny that it was with you that Mrs. Crosby kept a rendezvous on the lake the night she was murdered? Yes, I do deny it. I didn't see her that night at all. I have an alibi. I was home that night. My wife can bear witness to that. Oh, you have an alibi. And will you deny that Mrs. Crosby called you that morning to arrange a meeting? I don't know. I never got any message. I, I can prove that. You can prove it? The boathouse man, Hank Farley, was our go-between. You know, Crosby had leave him messages, and I'd contact her the same way. Oh, that's how you did it, huh? Yeah, but Frank Farley will tell you he didn't give me any message that day. I asked him if he had anything for me, and he said no. Ask him, he'll tell you. I see. Well, that's a point we can settle right now. Your Honor, I would like to excuse this witness with the privilege of recalling him after Farley has testified. I would like to call Hank Farley at this point to question him about what the defendant has just testified. Very well. If there's no objection, the witness may be excused, subject to recall. No objection. Call Henry Farley if he's in the courtroom. Yeah, I'm here. Will you come up here, please? You can step down, Mr. Blake. Up here. Hank, is it true what Mr. Blake has just testified, that he and Mrs. Crosby exchanged notes and phone calls through you? Well, yeah, they paid me for it, and it was none of my business what they did. I see. And now, on July 18th, did you give Mr. Blake a message for Mrs. Crosby? Well, no, I didn't. But she telephoned. Didn't she ask you to pass on a message to Mr. Blake? Yeah, but, well, I forgot to give it to him, that's all. You forgot? Even though he asked you if there was a note for him? I don't remember him asking me. If I'd done that, I would have remembered. But I did ask you, Hank. Don't you remember? I called you down on my boat just before he shoved off and asked you. You said there wasn't any message. Order. Order, please. Well, Hank? Well, I don't remember nothing like that. Anyways, I forgot to give him the message. I see. You forgot that you saw Mrs. Crosby go out to keep her date that night. Yeah, about ten o'clock. And you didn't stop her, Hank, even though you hadn't delivered her message. Well, I... 
Uh, I was afraid to tell her. I, I knew that she'd be real angry. Uh, I'd forgotten. I, I, I was afraid. Are you sure it was Mrs. Crosby you saw, Hank? Could you see her well enough to tell what she had on? Yeah, sure. She was wearing a white fluffy dress and a, a pearl necklace. That There was flour in her hair. Yeah, sure, it was her, all right. And are you sure you recognized Mr. Crosby when he followed her? What was he wearing? Well, I... I, I don't remember, but it was him, all right. I, I saw him, all right. You don't remember what he was wearing? No, I, I forget. Think hard, Hank. Was he in evening clothes, or was he wearing white flannels, or what? Think. I tell you, I don't remember. Hank, isn't the reason you can't remember because you never saw him that night? Yeah, sure, I saw him. He admits he was there. What, what is this, anyway? Yeah, he was there for Hank, but... You didn't see him because you weren't there. Oh, what do you mean? You weren't there, Hank. And I told you I was. I told you everything that happened. No, you told us what you guessed had happened, what must have happened from the facts you know. But your story didn't check with what really happened. You made little mistakes that puzzled me all along. What do you mean? What mistake? You said that Mr. Crosby followed his wife to the dock ten minutes after his wife left. He tells us it was less than five minutes. Yeah, well, what's a few you minutes? You said that you shouted at him when he started up the launch that didn't belong to him, that he sailed off without paying any attention to you. But Tom Crosby said it took him a while to get that launch started. Your Honor, I don't see the purpose or relevance of this line of questioning. Your Honor, the purpose is to show that this man is lying, that he wasn't anywhere near the boathouse that night because he was out on one of the small islands on the lake Waiting for Lenore Crosby. Your Honor. No, no, I wasn't. You're crazy. That's why you can tell us so exactly what Lenore Crosby was wearing that night, though you couldn't even remember if her husband was wearing white flannels or evening dress. You could tell us what she wore because you saw her close to held her in your arms that night. No. You remembered the flower in her hair because you were inhaling its fragrance at the very moment. The very moment your hands were closing about her throat to strangle her. Weren't you? No, I didn't do it. I wasn't there. I was nowhere near Potato Island that night. I was at the boathouse. Potato Island? So that's where you met her. That's where you murdered no, her. No, no, I just meant that he... Will you leave me alone? You kept the rendezvous in place of Frederick Blake, didn't you? No! Hank, are you going to let an innocent man go to his death for something you did? Isn't one murder on your conscience enough? It wasn't murder. I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't want her to die. But you did kill her! Yeah, yeah, I did! I killed her! We return to the dramatic confession of Hank Farley in just a moment. Breaking down under the relentless pounding of the defense attorney, Hank Farley collapsed and confessed his guilt. And later, when he had recovered his composure, he told what had happened on the fateful night of July 18th. No, Crosby was a bad one. She led me on. You know, little things like, like squeezing your hands. She let me kiss her once. But she, she just drove me crazy. Well, I, I decided to keep that date she meant for Fred Blake. When she got to, to the island that night, I was there waiting for her. She was scared. And, and when I tried to kiss her, she, she fought me and she called me names like I was dirt under her feet. Well, I just lost my temper. I choked her to make a stop. I, I choked her and I... When I let go of her, she, she was dead. But, but I didn't mean to kill her. With the confession of Hank Farley, Tom Cosby was acquitted of the charge that he had murdered his wife. Farley was sentenced to a term of life imprisonment for his crime. And so ended the story of Lenore Crosby, a young and beautiful girl whose misconduct brought her to a violent end and brought bitter tragedy into the lives of the men who loved her. Famous jury trials, the drama of the courts, drawn from actual courtroom cases. This is a Grace Gibson radio production, directed by Lawrence H. Cecil.